guest today is the director of media at texags.com and the general manager of Texas Filmworks, Andrew Kilzer. Welcome to the show. Morning. How are you? I am great. It is a pleasure to have you on. It's good to be here. I um, I haven't done a podcast since like 2010 when the original Tex Eggs podcast was happening before the radio show. So this is like coming back to my roots. Now, who, who hosted that show? Uh, it was Brandon Jones, a couple of users and myself. Okay. Um, it was wildly unpopular, but I did get well, recognized once in Kyle Field for my voice. And that <laughs> went straight to my head. It was <laughs> it was fantastic. As, as it does. Yeah. So we'll start with our icebreaker question. What is your favorite superpower? Oh, gosh. Um, I would love to be able to fly or travel back in time. What would you do if you could travel back in time? I don't know. Hopefully correct some past errors, okay. but probably just like make wagers on sporting Gamble events. on sporting events. Sure. Back I to mean, the future that's, too. I think what everybody would probably do at right. first. So for anyone who's not familiar, what is Texags. So Texags is an uh, is a collection of Aggie fans um, that covers A and M sports. Um, we're not affiliated with the university, but we do cover every sport in quite a bit of depth. Mm-hmm. Um, football, football recruiting are our main pushes as far as content goes. Um, but we also cover basketball, baseball softball. Um, we're doing more track, some of the Olympic sports we're getting into more. That's close to my heart. Oh, are you an athlete? Well, for, former, former, former athlete, long okay. retired. Gotcha. Gotcha. Back in the day. Gotcha. Um, no tech Sex is, is really just a lot of Aggies online and, um, it's grown into sort of this media, um, media giant for this town, at least, um, covering stuff. Um, with as much depth and, and people and, and effort as anyone and a- anyone else in this market and honestly more effort in my opinion than not effort, but more people dedicated to it than, than a lot of other people. Being the general manager of Texas Filmworks, which is an affiliate of Texags, your class of 2007 and got started as Texags director of content in 2008. What inspired you to get into production and video work? You mentioned that you helped host the podcast as well the media side of things. Sure. So I was actually a middle school education major on campus. Mm -hmm. My mom has taught math in the eighth grade since I, since before I was born. And so I thought, man, I really love the idea of being a teacher. It just felt like something I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I go through school as a middle school education major. And when I get into my student teaching, I realized that I am the worst at that (laughs) and I would not be happy with myself in five, 10 years if I was still teaching. And so, um, in that time, so in, in, in the summer of 2005, um, summer 2005, 2006, I can't remember exactly. I was going to church with the guys that run tech eggs. And I was like, man, I need a summer job. I need something to do. And so I actually ended up working uh, for Brandon Jones, the president and CEO of TexEx, uh, part time out of his house. It was he had just left another company and was was going uh, full time with TexEx. He had sold his portion of this other site or this other service called Traviston. And then he was going uh, to run TexEx full time. And so I came on and really wasn't doing a whole lot other than formatting HTML for the Maroon and White newsletter for what it was back in that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, it, what, what that was, um, Billy Lucci and Brandon got together and they took the Myrna White newsletter and Brandon digitized it for Billy. Mm-hmm. And then Billy still sent out a print version. He still mailed that out. And so my job was to take the print version, put in some photos and format it for HTML, which I had absolutely no business doing. And I'm still not, I still don't really know what I was doing. I can, I can apply like a line break and insert an image into HTML, but that's really about it. Um, and there was this one story where Brandon's wife had his, had their first baby while I was working out of the house with them. And at one point they needed to go like take care of something, like get something out of the car. Right. And so they lay their daughter on the floor. So I'm in this room, this college kid, and there's this baby on the floor. And I'm like, <laughs> I have no idea what to do if this baby needs help. But um, so I'm working for them. I'm student teaching. I realized that I hate the idea of teaching because I just, I just wasn't something that was, I felt like I was good at. Um, We're going to come back to that. That's great. And so I, um, I, I'm about to graduate and they say, Hey, Andrew, we can't hire you. We don't have, we, we can't hire you full time. 
And I was bummed, but I was like, guys, I get it. Let me keep working part time while I find another job looking for another job. Luckily, they ended up moving some things around. Um, they still had their the, the site was still hosted out of a colo in downtown Bryan at the time. Um, and it, it, they were raising their prices. They ended up moving the site up to up to a colo in Dallas, um, which saved them some money, which allowed them to bring me on. And so I started full time at Texag really just after I graduated in 2000, the, the spring of 2008. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was the media director. And at that time, media director was really just like getting all the photos that we could get of recruits and different things and kind of bring them on board. But about that same time, like YouTube was really taking off. Mm-hmm. Um, and Brandon had a couple cameras with with long lenses. And I was like, man, let me let me take this and see what I can get at football games. So I started shooting football games. That was the beginning of the Mike Sherman era, which that first game we lost. I was there. Yeah, it was really sad. Um, so that wasn't a great start, but that was really where I started taking photos and trying to kind of get into that world. And and with YouTube and photos... I was like, hey, we need to find a camera. So we ended up buying a really terrible digital camera that we had no business. We didn't really know what we were looking for even. Um, So we bought it, started experimenting with it, and kind of just backed my way into doing this stuff from YouTube tutorials and, and honestly hiring people who are better at it than I am. So that's that's really the secret to my mediocre success at this point. Now, so you've you've now brought up two different things that you've done for a living or aspired to do for a living. And you said that you were bad at both of them, but you guys have a fair bit of success over sure. at, over at Texags and, and with the Texas Filmworks thing. What do you think makes you good at bringing people together in that way? What are you? I'll say this. I don't think I'm bad at film. I'm not as good as my team, uh-huh. right? I can do something, but so Brandon, the, the president and CEO of Texags, Brandon Jones, um, he he's always harped on me or he's always tried to tell me that you don't have to be really good at something. You mm-hmm. just have to be willing to step back and realize that if your team is good at it, then you're good at it. That sounds to me like the definition of a producer. Yeah. And and that's that's really what I've tried to take take hold of as much as I can. And um it's been more difficult for me than I than I would have thought. And that's, I think, because um, you can ask my mom or my wife or, or any woman, my sister or my daughters even, and they'll probably say that I love attention. Um, and um, but but because of that, I've had to realize that my success is built on the team being good at something. Sure. And so my first my first number of years at Texags were me just developing this like foundation of what looks good, what feels good in this produced content world. Hmm. Um, and now it's more of I know what's good and I know that there are people who are just better at it than I am. And so now my my goal is how do I shore these people up, give them the resources, give them the time, the space and the uh, creative freedom that they need to be able to do something really well. What's the most surprising thing that you've learned about how to do that? part of the process, just assembling the team, getting them resources. What has been much easier about that than you would have expected? What's been much harder about that than you would have expected? Anything like that? Um, the easier part of it has been, um, I don't know. There's not a lot about that. That's easy for me right now. That Maybe if you ask me in 10 years, <laughs> I'll say, Oh man, I had no idea how easy this could be when you realized it. the harder parts are things like, um, developing trust within your team. Mm. I trust all of them implicitly. I think they're all really, really talented, but getting them to trust each other has been a little bit harder. Um, and, and that just comes with working together and, and realizing that they need to just lean on each other more. The, the, the interesting thing is when you hire creatives, they all want to do something on their own, mm. right? Everybody's like, I can do this. I can do this. Let me, let me just do this. But the reality is that the, the projects and the scope of things that we take on these days are so much bigger than what one person can pull off well. Right. Um, we did a shoot last week and somebody was like, hey, we just need one person and one camera. It's like, well, we can do that. But when we have these this team and all of this gear that's really – this talented team and this really good equipment, we really need to step back and say it takes all of us coming together to make this thing what it can really be. And so um, it's just a matter of realizing that all of us are better than one of us. Right. And 
it seems when working with creatives, I think what creative people are often most afraid of in the creative context is the idea that someone's going to tell them, no, don't tell the story this way, tell the story that way. And it's going to be something that they feel like is not good and they know of a better way to do it, but they're forced to do it this other way. So engendering that trust is as much about convincing them that these other people are smart, they have good ideas and they'll listen to your good ideas. Does that bear out with your experience? Uh, I think it does bear out. And I think with, with my team, it's this idea of, um, we know that our clients all have good stories. Mm -hmm. There's, there's a good story in any organization and our role is really helping the client see that story come out. Right. And, and, and convincing our client that, Hey, if you can take a step back and let us look at this with a fresh set of eyes, we might find a story here or we might find a narrative that you had no idea about. Right. Um, and so that's been um, that's been something that's really rewarding watching my team do that more and more because we all go in with some preconceived notions of who a client is or what an organization is about. But then it's really fun watching my team say, oh, no, you think you're this, but the reality is you're more of this. And we want to help you show these parts of who you are. Who are your clients? Um, we do a lot of work on campus. Uh, Mays Business School is one of my more exciting clients to have because uh, in, in the last year or so, um, we've done a bunch of work for the MBA program mm -hmm. um, and we do a lot of work for the Mays Marcom team. And what's really fun with both of those teams spe uh, specifically is that they um, they let us just kind of do what we're going to do. They don't really want to constrict us too much. Uh, we do a lot of the marketing content for the Association of Former Students. Um the the College of Liberal Arts. We also have some clients in Houston, Dallas. We've done some stuff nationally. And um, yeah, it's this year is about maintaining relationships on campus, finding more colleges and organizations to do work with. McFerrin Center is another one of our great clients. Mm -hmm. um, and this year is about about more of that, but then also breaking into more of a corporate and agency kind of model for us doing more and different things. Interesting. So you, so going back to your story, you came back to the university and functioned as communications coordinator for about a year. What was it like going from student to administrator here on campus? Yeah. So I, I left Tech Ags in 2012 right. to go to the division of research. Um, I knew I needed to get away from Tech Sags for a little bit because I just I'd hit a ceiling and I wasn't going to do I'd had some pretty frank conversations with those guys and knew that what they needed at the time I, I wasn't capable of doing and or I didn't want to do. And so um, there's a guy named Tom Hargis who was the um, I don't know, assistant to the VP or whatever <laughs> of research at the time. Right. Um, and he brought me on his team and <clears throat> the goal was to aggregate stories that were happening on campus and make sort of this landing page for interesting content mm. related to research and different functions on campus. He, I, I feel like he was a little bit of ahead of his time with that, especially here at A&M. Um, the problem was the VP of research at the time um, resigned uh, about three weeks into me being on campus. Mm. And so everything we were doing kind of ground to a halt. Um, we, we went into, um, just keep things rolling mode. And so what I was brought on to help sort of push forward and figure out how we do differently just didn't happen anymore. And so after, after a little less than a year, I realized I was just super bored. Um, nothing wrong with being on campus. I just knew that, uh, if I stayed in that position, I wasn't going to get better at what I was doing. I wasn't excited about what I was doing. Um, and so I had to have a really hard conversation with Tom and tell him, hey, I just need to go do something else. Um, another opportunity to come up. And so I decided to, to take that. That makes sense. Yeah. So you went back to Tex Ags in 2016. You mentioned earlier that there was a confluence of factors that had kind of nudged you out the door of the company previously. There were things that you couldn't do or didn't want to do. Was there also sort of this flavor of like never a hero in your own hometown? Like you kind of had to go off and, um, 
I don't, I don't know quite what I'm no, asking. No, I, I understand here. what you're saying. It's, it's hard to go home and be looked at the same way, right? Mm. What? So I left TechSags and went to the division of research. Right. After the division of research, I went and helped run a local production company, um, and that was where I really sort of realized what works, what doesn't. Um, how I want to be treated as an employee Hmm. and then more importantly, how I want to treat other people. Um, it was a, it was a really rough few years for my family and I, um, I see between the division of research and between my second time around at sex eggs. And so, um, in that time I, I realized I needed a more mature organization to go back to. Uh, and I also wanted the freedom to grow my own team. Mm. Um, you know, once you have a taste of some independence and some entrepreneurial like freedom, it's really difficult in my opinion to go and just be told what to do all the time. Yep. Um, and so going back to tech sags, Brandon Jones and I had had a couple conversations and I told him, Hey, I need to change. I need to figure something out. And so I actually ended up leaving the first, my, my, the job after the university, um, before Brandon was able to offer me a job. And so it was kind of a, um, I have to quit this. I have to, I have to have a change and I don't know if tech sags is going to be it or not, but I, I just can't keep doing what I'm doing. And so, um, I left and I call Brandon was like my first or second phone call. And I said, Hey, I left. When are we going to do this thing? Yeah. And he was like, okay, <laughs> let me get a couple meetings set up. So we had a couple meetings and, um, the, the really cool thing about going back to tech Ags the second time around is they had matured as an organization pretty considerably from when I left. And so processes, people, all of that stuff was just more tightened down for them. And so it wasn't like I was going back into this, uh, tech Ags was kind of a startup was really a startup when I went back, when, when I started there. And when I went back, it, it, they had sort of shifted out of that startup phase and were into more of a growth phase for themselves. Right. Um, and so coming back into that world, I was able to just sort of get my team up and running and I wasn't dealing with all the, all the stuff that a startup deals with of we don't know what this is and we've never dealt with this problem. They had already figured all that stuff out. So... So now, how is the culture of TechSags different from TechSags is in kind of a growth stage, as you described, mm-hmm. and a place like Texas A&M is more in, I would say, a maturity phase. Sure. Um, so how is the culture different between one and another? How is working for one different from working for the other? Um, the great thing about... And, and this is only my experience, right? There's different groups on campus that I think are a little bit more nimble than my group was when I was here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a lot of that is because the VP resigned and my team was just kind of yeah. in this weird phase. When I was here, it was really difficult to get anything moving. Um, and, and part of that was I wasn't here long enough necessarily to learn all the people I needed to talk to to push the right buttons and pull the right levers to, right. to get things going. Um the great thing about an organization the size of TechSags, which is, you know, 30 to 40 people, um, is when things need to happen, they happen really quickly. Um, and so even more so with my team at Texas Filmworks, formerly TPG, um, there's five of us that are full time. And so when we need to do something, we just do it. Yeah, there's just not, open the door and like. Yeah, there's not a lot of this. Um, Hey, we need to figure out how to do this or let's, let's get a meeting together. It's more like, Oh no, you're just going to go do that. Okay. Let's, let's talk about that and then let's debrief when it gets done. So, um, those are, that's the main difference for me, but the, the, the things that I think are really similar are, um, Texas A&M in the, in the last few years I've noticed is really pushing itself to get better at storytelling, marketing, um, putting themselves out there than I had seen in the past. Um, and I feel like tech sags is the same way we're trying to continue pushing the envelope content wise. So I feel like in the, in that sense, they're both really similar. Have you ever read Daniel Pink's book, a whole new mind? I've not. It's a great book about um, expanding the ways that you're able to think about things. And story is one of the big ones. And okay. I think that a lot of organizations are learning uh, learning about the power of narrative in terms of getting a message across. Um, 
but uh, I think uh, I'll say one thing to that. I feel like um, the organizations realizing that their narrative is something that needs to be out there is really interesting because we're all so used to being marketed to all the time mm-hmm. that we have a really high bar for knowing when we're being marketed to. So if you can figure out a way to to market to someone without them feeling as if they're being marketed to, uh, especially in the online space, I think that's where your organizations start to see a win. And that's where A&M is doing a really good job with a lot of that stuff. Right. Uh, and I hope I'm helping people push people into some of that right. in that um, interesting stories are interesting stories. Yeah. And I think it's even okay if someone knows they're being marketed to, sure. as long as it's in a way that feels like you're giving me something back yes. by telling me this interesting story. And so I'll sit here and listen. You can have my eyeballs and my eardrums for, you know, five minutes while I listen to this or 20 minutes if that's what's yeah. appropriate. But yeah, absolutely. But it's a, it's a give and take. It's not just buy our thing check out our website. It's, it's look at this cool thing that we did here was how it got there. Sure. Here was what informed what we were doing. Here was why we cared. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I agree. And your LinkedIn says, I want to come up. I, I want to help come up with new and interesting ways to tell stories. So if you had to pick a secret sauce that makes content great, one thing that you always try to get to that isn't immediately obvious, what would that be? I want to always find a personal story. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things my team and I talk about a lot is it's a lot better to create content that's an inch, an inch wide and a mile deep Mm. as opposed to a mile wide and an inch deep. So how do we (laughs) tell a specific moment in time and how do we kind of dive into that moment and, and, and dissect that specific thing instead of trying to tell everything for a client. Mm-hmm. I'll sit down with somebody and and one of the first conversations we have is what are you trying to get this video to communicate? What do you want this to do? And they're like, well, we want to hit these 15 points in a two minute video. I'm like, well, the, the, the goal for my team is typically how do we, how do we get beyond that to say, instead of let's communicate these 15 things at once, let's communicate one thing really well. Mm. And my, my thought is if we can get a client to help us find a really good personal story to tell, um, and we can do that by telling one moment in, in one person's life from one, one point in time, I feel like that's the stuff that we are really, really good at helping, helping to to figure out and and to put into a completed piece. It's hard for people sometimes to relate to a company much easier for them to relate to a person. Sure. Because, and, and the, the interesting thing is companies are just people, right? Yes. Um, And, but I think a lot of organizations try to be so high minded and their, their mission statements are so difficult for somebody to catch on to that. The reality is, um, if, If you can break away from that and say, hey, this is just a moment in time and this is just one of our people who who is a part of our company, that's where I think things start to get really interesting. And not just companies, but organizations, too. So from a technical perspective or a marketing perspective, are there any cool innovations or techniques you like to use to maximize the impact of these personal stories? Sure. So I think my team is really good at a couple of things in that way. One, one of the first conversations we have with the client is let's see your brand package. Let's understand where your visual goals are. Mm -hmm. Um, and then let's, um, let's figure out where you're, where you're trying to go with this story or this, this piece we're creating. And we'd like to start with seeing your brand package because typically for a lot of smaller organizations, that's been a big growth point for them. When you sit down and you come up with a logo and you develop a website and you come up with your, your mission statement, all that, that's a lot of times the first moment a company is really decide like that's a growing up moment, right? Um, for us, you know, I just started doing any work I could for a while. Hmm. And I was like, well, I've done that. Now I need to realize, well, what's the work I want to do versus just what is it that's coming my way? If we can get in with a client and understand what their visual goals are, then we're going to tailor the piece to match that as best as we can. Um, the cameras we use are all, um, it sounds super dorky 
to me, but they're all cinema cameras. Okay. Um, so I'm not using like what a typical news crew would go out and shoot with. Um, there are news crews that go out and shoot with stuff like us, but it's more like a vice or uh, some of the national organizations that will go out and shoot. What are the differences? Just longer lenses or? Uh, no, it's it's a few things. Um Oh gosh. Um, so the kind of camera, the cameras we shoot with are nerd time. We're going to get nerdy here. I'm just going to, I'll break this down. We shoot with a Sony F 55, um, which some stuff that's been the, the thing I point to mostly that is shot on F 55 is the show, the crown on Netflix. Um, and so this camera is when you get into the world of like cinema cameras, you don't get a lens as a part of the camera. Right. Uh, you have to go out and buy a lens separately Mm -hmm. and, and the kind of lenses that you put on it do some things really, really well. Uh, the glass is typically higher end. Um, and then they, they do some other things like their aperture, which is how much light is allowed in the camera is all, um, is all fluid. So when you're shooting with like an SLR camera, when you're opening up the aperture, it does it in what's called F stops. And so the F stops will actually click open. So you actually see these like flashes on your screen. Hmm. Uh, with the with the lenses we shoot with, that's a completely um fluid motion. So you can you can crank that thing wide open and let in all the light and it just looks like the screen got brighter. Mm-hmm. Uh the things it doesn't do, they don't autofocus. Uh, so you're always, you always have somebody that's pulling focus on site, uh, on set. And, and that role is typically what's called the first AC. So the first AC is in charge of building out the camera and pulling focus. Um, the cinematographer is in charge of setting the look. So we always have a cinematographer slash our creative director on set. Mm. Uh, we always have our first AC on set and then a producer and maybe a director. If the cinematographer can't do that as well, do you guys clap slate? You have a second. We AC? don't all, we will clap slate. We don't always do that. Uh, we don't always shoot two cameras. I don't always feel like it's necessary. Right. Um, you know, there is some of a game though. Like, when you're going in to shoot a big project, uh, one of our new guys says, you got to come correct. And he says it much cooler than I do. <laughs> when I say it, I just sound like a, 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 a white guy that's getting older. Um, but it's, it's, a, it, it's one of those things where if you go in and you're shooting a big corporate client, it makes sense to go in there and kind of pull out all the stops to show them, hey, we really do know what we're doing. Um, and so we'll, we'll look at a brand package. Uh, our camera selection is pretty high end. Um, and, and even at that, like we'll bring in a lens if we need to. Like we were shooting a piece for the association last summer and I went and rented like I went and rented a lens out of Houston that I ended up looking at online. It was like a $50,000 lens. Mm -hmm. And it's this one thing that we had for a day. And so it was fun to get to play with that. Um, Was it cook? What kind of glass? It was an airy master prime Ah, 12 millimeter. Um, And so it was a, we're going to the next level of nerddom now. Yeah. Like, Look up an Airy Master Prime 12 millimeter. It's like a 10 inch diameter lens. Um, <laughs> it was very, very cool and, and pretty fun to play with. Right. But so, in addition to that, we're, we're always conscious of lighting, we're always conscious of camera movement. Um, and then, what are the shots that we're getting? What are the images we're getting? How are those going to feed into the story? It's not just a, a random, we're going to shoot whatever we can, whenever we can. It's more of a, how, how does our B-roll footage, so A-roll is the interview, B-roll is the, the visuals that accompany it. How does that B-roll footage help to further the story mm-hmm. and not just add clutter to the whole thing? So those, that, sorry, I'm coming back to it. Those are the ways that we really try to work to to enhance a client's story through how we're shooting. Uh, going back to uh, come correct sure. and, you know, create it's, it's also interestingly in the process of the production itself is a story and for the client to feel like they are in the story mm-hmm. and experiencing something that really makes a difference. I was working on a commercial many years back. I won't say where and I won't say who, but we left the mics on and the client between takes, we were listening to the audio afterwards and we heard the client say to himself between takes, just on a regular commercial at an office building, client saying, I'm Jack Bauer. (laughs) I'm Jack Bauer. (laughs) And it, it, it was a, it was a funny moment, but it also taught us something, which is it matters to make them feel like they are 
Jack Bauer or whoever it is that yep. they want to be. Yep. Like that's you have the power to make someone feel that way, even as they are then helping someone else feel a different way when they sure. see the story. Sure. So and 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 going and going a little bit further into that, it's this, it's this idea of um, I run a service business, right? Mm-hmm. My business is a service. Sure. And so um, I get a win when my client gets a win. Yes. So if the client is there and they're pumped and excited and they're tweeting out photos of this ridiculous setup that we've got, even if some of that setup is superfluous for us, like even if we feel like, hey, we could do this just as well without bringing in all of this extra stuff. Mm-hmm. Some of that is how do we help them get a win from this moment? Um, and, you know, even as simple as like, hey, we're going to bring in a wireless video and let the client sit there and just watch watch everything we're doing, even though they might not do anything with it. It's a fun toy to sit and play with right. or, Hey, you want to pull focus on this remote focus puller? It's just, it's just kind of geeky and, and interesting. Right. But as much as you can give them that Jack Bauer win moment, it, right. it feels like it's, uh, accomplishing the goal a little bit more of getting them excited for what they're going to see at the end. Tall director's chairs are another thing people seem to get excited Tall about. Tall director's chairs and anytime you can have something that you're calling craft services, right. even or, if that's like some granola bars, <laughs> it feels like a win. Video Village. Video Village. that people yeah, like. that's good. There was, I was, another show I was working on, uh, this one was also a while back. The One of the most impressive things I've ever seen on production was this truck drove in with a Musco light on it and then it just ratcheted the thing up. <laughs> and we were lighting a house. Yep. It was nothing, but yep. we were trying to create moonlight basically. And so we have this like Kyle field size stadium lights just built onto the back of this truck and it goes up and then lights the house and the director says, okay, go. And like, it's, (laughs) it was so cool. Yeah, It's wild. Very impressive. Yeah. So what is the role of, so you talked about tweeting stuff out, that sort of thing. Obviously social media play a huge role in all of this, you know, in promotion and marketing, what's the role of social media in what you do with Texas Filmworks and Texags in general? Um, Sure. So let me start with Texags. Texags, um, when I was there, I started, I think the Texags Twitter account back when Twitter was brand new. mm -hmm. Um, and I started my own Twitter account at that same time. I don't run, I don't use Twitter at this point. Neither Um, do I. I just, I think I got we do, on, but I, I don't. I got on Twitter and and it was the time of Twitter where it's like find people in your area. And there was like one dude mm-hmm. in town that had a Twitter. So I was like, well, this is just boring. There's nobody here. Right. Um so when I left and came back, the Tex Exit hired a guy named Stuart Wade. Okay. To come and run all of the social. And Stu is um you you meet some people who are just immensely talented. Um, and Stu is one of the most talented people I know at doing that. Okay. And so they've made Texags and Stu have made a big push to um, opening up the Texag experience. I would say Stu might say it differently, but opening up the Texag experience to a social net, a social audience. Um, so a lot of the Texags model is built on paywall content. And mm-hmm. so m- most of the good stuff is behind the paywall. So you pay, I think it's twelve ninety nine a month plus tax to get all of the premium content. Sure. Um, but that doesn't mean that people on Facebook don't want to interact with text eggs, don't want to know some nuggets of information or some other stuff. So Stu puts a big effort towards like silly graphics during football games. The text eggs Twitter account gets a ton of traffic during football games and it's just Stu's stream of consciousness. Um, <laughs> And then, you know, there's always a wrap up graphic or, you know, if it's a big win, it might be some silly meme that he creates. But it it allows people um, that are just general Aggie fans to see this really well produced thing that they can get excited about. And then they share that. Right. And so the Tex Ag social stuff has really been a big push to get more people familiar with the brand, because for a long time, I think Tex Ag's was this thing that your dad got onto, um, And it wasn't something that a lot of young people were were experiencing. Um, but in the last number of years, it's gotten to be something that more and more students are a part of. Um, one thing we did a few years ago, and this was just some silliness that I cooked up, but, um, we were doing this piece called the history of Aggie football, uh, which is a piece we did for fish camp and the fish camp approached us and they're like, we want you to talk to the students about tech sex. And we're like, you don't, 
you just want us to talk about tech tags. This feels weird. And they're like, well, I mean, you can do something else if you want. And we're like, well, let, let us let us give you some interesting content. And so we decided to tell the history of Texas A&M football since the Internet. Um, so it was kind of this thing where we were able to take um, new students coming into Texas A&M from the early 90s uh, all the way up to the current day. And so as a part of that, at the end, we're like, well, our first game this year is against UCLA. I was like, we need to talk some trash to UCLA fans. And so this is when the hydraulic press channel was a big deal on Reddit and YouTube. And so I'm like, well, I'm going to buy a UCLA helmet and then I'm going to find a hydraulic press and we're going to crush it. And we're just going to play this thing out at the end. And so that that translated into we're going to destroy a helmet or some piece of opposing fan paraphernalia before every game. And so we uh, we deep fried a helmet before South Carolina. Um, we dropped a piano on a helmet um, before a UTSA game. The Alabama helmet crush was this ridiculous, like bad dream sort of deal. But what was really fun with that is we created this whole thing and Paul Feinbaum picked it up each week. Uh, different ESPN shows would ask us for the rights to play it and they would play this content. Right. Um, and then we would play it on tech sags and then uh, we would post it on Facebook the day before the game and those would get, you know, hundreds of thousands of views. Right. Uh, Have you so done explosives yet? We did explode some cupcakes. Um, the university was not happy with me about that for some other reasons I won't get into, but what, what was fun with that was it was this idea of how do we get into show, social even more and how do we kind of give people something to be excited about. And for that season, it was a big it was a thing that everybody was looking forward to. And the Reddit threads would get up to thousands of upvotes and people from all over the country be like, these guys are idiots, but I can't stop watching them. And um so that was a lot of fun. And so for the Texas film work side of things, we want to help our clients get that same kind of play. We want to help our clients um, get into that world where a lot of them haven't done produced stuff before. And and the idea of like, oh, I can create something on my iPhone. You absolutely should. That should absolutely be the baseline of what everybody's doing, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Yeah. But um, our group tries to come in and help help give somebody help white label some content for a client where they they get that in hand and then they're excited to share those things out. Um, and so we just want to help our clients get some wins in the social world, however that might be. So you mentioned you mentioned Twitter. You just mentioned Reddit, which I think is kind of becoming a social medium by default. Sure. And we, we haven't really talked about Instagram uh, you've mentioned Facebook mm -hmm. of all of those. Where do you think your, where do you think your juice really is? Like I, Instagram, I like, but don't understand Twitter. I understand, but don't like Facebook. I understand like, but it's not, um, the optics of Facebook aren't super great right now. Sure. Um, and then Reddit is kind of the new kid in the room. I feel like from a social medium perspective. So what, if, if there's if there's one that you can get real engagement on, where are you looking for that? Um, I think it's really for whatever the client is looking for. Oh, okay. If it's a younger audience, I feel like Instagram is really where they should be focusing. Um, if it's a um, if it's an older clientele or you're trying to get people, you know, my age to my parents, you know, mid early to mid thirties up. I think Facebook is really good. Mm -hmm. Um, I think Twitter is a great way to interact with stuff, but I think for me, I see that as like an add on for things. Yeah. Um, Reddit is another interesting deal where, um, Reddit is, uh, like you said, Reddit is becoming a social network, but it's not a social network. Right. It's a, it's a content aggregator. It's a user generated content aggregator that people are starting to use more and more as a social network, I mm -hmm. think. Um, and so what I was really conscious of when our stuff was going on to Reddit is that none of us would ever post that to Reddit. Um, Cause part of the deal, part of the rules with that community is don't post your own stuff unless you tell it's your own stuff. Right. And so um, it was this idea of letting people catch a hold of our stuff and post that themselves. Um, and that's where we'd get better run. And sometimes we'd get on there and interact with it. And But, you know, Brandon Jones has done some AMAs on Reddit. And, mm -hmm. uh, I think Stu's, Stu has done one or two of those as well. And so it is becoming more of a social network, but it's really a content aggregator with a really 
active community behind it. And a lot of burner accounts. And a lot of burner accounts and a lot of places that uh, you just shouldn't shouldn't go looking for. <laughs> right. Yeah, th- that is for sure. Yeah. What is the single best story you've told? How about um, that segue? That's a that's a heck of a segue. Um, I think the single best story we've told. I'm going to this is going to be a cheesy answer is the last story we told. Huh? And the next story we've uh, told, okay. but I'll, I'll talk about a couple specifically. My favorite couple things we've done um, are we did this piece called Colonel Campbell's Final Flight for the Association of Former Students a couple years ago. And there was a former student, I think he was class of 57, mm-hmm. um, who was flying a jet over Laos during the Vietnam conflict. And he wasn't, a, we weren't in Laos at the time. The, the official line is we weren't in Laos. Um we were, but we weren't allowed to be there. Mm. Um, so, so Colonel Campbell's plane was shot down in, I think, 1968 or 69. Okay. Um, his plane was shot down and they never found any remains. His family knew he was he was killed in action, um, but they never got the closure of a of a of a funeral. Yeah. Well, in uh, December of 2016, um, basically what happens is the U.S. will go into these small villages in Laos and they'll. They'll talk to people and these these villagers have have held on to remains for whatever reason, Um, pieces of articles of clothing or um, different different things. And Colonel Campbell's Aggie ring had been found a number of years ago. Uh, There's an Aggie that was in. Uh, Vietnam bought his ring from a from a pawn shop or something. There's a really cool story the association told about that. The ring is now in a permanent collection at the association. Definitely worth going to check out. It's kind of one of those awesome Aggie stories. Um, but in December of 16, Colonel Campbell's remains were identified and they were brought back to um, brought back to Hawaii and identified and all that stuff. The family was notified. So the association said, hey, this might be one of the cool stories we get a chance to tell. Uh, we want to do a film. And so we came on board and said, we think we need to do a handful of things. We need to capture one of the things the the Air Force and all the military branches will do is when a soldier is brought back, they they put them in a full dress uniform. Mm. Um, when there's only remains, they build the uniform out and then put that into the casket. Okay. And so we we hired a crew in Hawaii. They didn't want to fly me to Hawaii for some reason, which I would have totally been up for. But hired a crew in Hawaii, and we got some really beautiful shots of that uniform being built out. Mm. Um, we got the casket going onto the plane, and then uh, Clay Taylor and I, one of the guys on my team, our production manager, met the plane in DFW when it landed. Um, they they fly they drive the plane through. Um, some water spouts by uh, shot by the fire trucks there at the, at the airport. And right. Like they make a, it into a big deal. Yeah. When a pilot retires from an airline, yeah, they do yeah. the same thing. So they say they do this. We got footage of them coming <laughs> off and, and then we actually got on the plane, uh, flew to flew to D.C. Mm. Um, and and we were able to tell the story of this man who was killed in action coming home and being laid to rest. Um, and just the idea of telling this family story was so interesting and impactful for me that I, um, I was just really proud to be a part of telling them that story. Of course. And then sharing that with the Aggie family was really neat too. How did the family react to all of that? What was their response to being able to finally bury their brother or father or, you know, whoever? Yeah. So the, the family's reaction was one of the more interesting parts of that to me. Um, I think it was, it probably mirrors what a lot of families' reactions would have been. There were two sisters and two brothers um, that were, th- that are alive. And mm-hmm. um, the the oldest, the oldest child um, was our point of contact and she was all about it. She was really excited and really grateful for us being able to tell the story. Um, one of the, one, her, her sister was also really excited to be able to tell the story. Uh, the brothers just weren't. Um, they weren't able to 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 be a part of it for their own hmm. emotional well being. I and, see. Um, and that that was great. You know, they just they they were really honest with us. They just said, "Hey, I just don't think I can do this," uh, and so we didn't push. But 
But the family's reaction and excitement to the whole thing was so gratifying. Um, And so the film came out in on Memorial Day in 2017. Um, And then the family came back in. So we the association was doing a Kyle Field sponsorship at the time. And so we recut that story to be a feature at in Kyle Field. And we coordinated with the athletic department. Uh, The association's team did and uh, told that story and then they did a big screen cut to the family. And so they're sitting there in the stands and they get to be on the screen. And it was it was a really touching moment. And we actually got to have dinner with the family the night before. My wife and I went to dinner with the association and a bunch of those. Our team got to go and see them again. And um, it was just really, really neat. They were so grateful that we were able to tell their story um, and do their dad this one last dignifying thing. Um, there's, I don't have many moments in my life where I really get to dignify something. And so the chance to do that was really, really powerful. And I think, I hope the family feels like we did justice to their dad. Um, cause you know, he passed away when the oldest daughter was 17 years old. And so, um, I've had twice as much time with my dad as, as she got, you know, and, and the other siblings were a little bit younger. And so, um, their reaction was about as good as I could have could have hoped for for telling that piece. This other story we told was called Lost Letterman. Um, this was in 2017 as well. Um, it was a group of Aggies were playing on a club soccer team in 1981. Uh, they got promoted to varsity status uh, at the end of that season. Um, then, long story short, football team ended up hiring Jackie Sherrill, which was the biggest contract in college football history at the time. I think he was making over a million a year. Um, it's a good thing we haven't done that since then. Sure. Jackie claims that he didn't cut the budget. Um, I don't know that I believe that. Um, but they got they were varsity for a single season and then they got relegated back to club status Uh, the real shame there though is that those guys have never been recognized as lettermen by the university uh even though they were varsity there was articles all this stuff they were never recognized as a varsity team uh even to this day so we told the story of this team we flew down to el salvador where a couple of the guys lived told the whole story and then we did a a film premiere where we uh actually worked with the team to have their first reunion since the 81 season so most of the guys came back got to hang out see each other and we tried to tell their story we tried to do their story some justice um so that was a really really worthwhile thing was not a marketing piece but it was one of those stories that We just had to do. How did they, how did they respond? What was, what was their reaction from an emotional standpoint? They were all just really excited to get to be a part of it. I think they're all a little bit frustrated. They're not Letterman, which I think we all were as well. Yeah. Um, but those guys were really, really gracious and, and generous with their time and being willing to tell their story. And so, um, at the same time, they were just stoked to get to see their buddies again. Yeah. So that was fun. In terms of things you draw inspiration from, has there been another successful video campaign or advertising campaign, even a social media campaign that really struck or resonated with you? Um, I I do find myself watching a lot of stuff online. Mm-hmm. Um I'm all, I'll be honest. I'm also trying to not watch as much stuff these days. One, cause I feel like I spend so much time in front of a screen that I, I need to just get away from it. Um, and two, and, and that sounds weird considering I do this, I know, but I, I do feel like my life is just so inundated with digital content that there's, there's a part of me that's like, I need to pull away from this in some ways and make it more intentional when I'm doing it. Said everyone. Yeah. And I'm not great at it. I'm working. My wife would say, you need to work harder. And so (laughs) (laughs) I will try. Um, no, there's, there's a few that I've really, I've really loved. Um, the show that I tell everybody they need to watch is a uh, is a Netflix show called chef's table um it's it's my favorite things in the world coming into one thing it's personal stories it's really beautiful visuals and it's delicious food or at least i think it's delicious Uh, they basically follow um restaurants that are part of the top 50 restaurants in the world um and they they go and they tell these chef stories and this isn't like a guy that cooks at chili's it's you know 
um, Michelin stars. It, it's, and, it's three star Michelin restaurants right. like Osteria Francesca and Modena Italy is one of them. And, um, uh, you know, the guy that run, uh, Grant Ackett's runs Eleni in, in Chicago and, and it's kind of, it's taking these people that make this haute cuisine, this uh, avant-garde sort of food, and it, it tells their stories. And it's just gorgeous. Like, I've actually thought about emailing these guys and being like, can I just tag it along? I just kind of want to see what you do. <laughs> um, I love that. Uh, there's another campaign I really like called Made in Illinois um, that I think is just really, really beautiful. Um it's What's the backdrop of that one? Made in Illinois is a is an effort by the state of Illinois oh, okay. to get people to come as tourists oh. to the state. And so yeah. what they do is they go and um, they've got a beautiful website and a really great campaign set up. And it's it's run for a few years now. But but basically they take these small stories um, and they work to um, they work to tell these stories well in an effort to get people to come. And so there's a story about like a hat company in Chicago and a company that makes really good popcorn. And they're just telling these little vignetted stories, um, in an effort to get people to, to visit and have a little bit more connection. And that's, it's, it's so in line with what we try to be about at Texas Filmworks that I feel like it's, it's something I have drawn some inspiration from trying to, excuse me, trying to push clients into, Hey, Doing an interview is fine, but telling a story is way better. Here, look at this. This is this is how I'd propose we we work through this stuff. So, Very nice. Yeah. Let's move to some rapid fire questions. What do you consider your most valuable failure? Well, let me start this by saying I feel like I failed a lot. And and I um I'm trying to get better at not taking failure so personally. Hmm. Um, but but I I I think um looking back and realizing that failure in the last few years, I've, I've had to realize that failure is just an opportunity to get better at something. Mm. Um, and so anytime that I feel like I've let a client down and, and I've had to go back and, and work to make it better has been really valuable for me. Um, it doesn't happen a lot anymore. It did happen a lot at one time, but I, you know, you get better at what you're doing and you, and you do less of that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think any time that you have to go back sort of hat in hand, um, and say, I messed this up, but I'm going to make it better is is a really good chance to get to not only get better as a as a professional but to get better as a person hmm. i think anytime you're willing to admit that you were wrong and that you or that you didn't live up to your own expectations i hope that clients um have been able to receive that well and see that um i'm not perfect at what i do i don't ever really claim to be perfect but i, I hope that they see that i'm willing to say i mess this up i'm gonna do whatever i can to make it better i think those are the failures that I have grown the most out of. What do you think is people's biggest misconception of you? Oh my gosh. I am the, I'm a quintessential, um, extrovert. I love people. I get energy from being around a group of people. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I think for my team, there are just days when I just don't want to be around people. Um, and you know, being in a sales role, being in a, a managerial role, you're just around people a lot. And so I think the biggest misconception is that if I'm not in a great mood, it means that like the world, my world is over, mm -hmm. but it's more just like, Hey, I just need a day to just be off, you know? Um, and hopefully as I get older, that happens less and less. But <laughs> I think the biggest misconception is that I'm always in the best mood ever. And that's just not, not possible for me, unfortunately. If you could have anyone as a mentor for one day, who would it be? This was a really hard question for me to come up with because I feel like anybody I say I'm pandering. <laughs> um, but I'll be honest. And the, the one the one person who I, I I've thought, oh, who am I going to say? Is it somebody that's like totally unattainable? I would have loved to have um, like dinner with George HW Bush, just cause I've done a lot for the, I've done a lot for the foundation and I've covered the family quite a bit, but mm -hmm. I just, every story I hear about the man seems like he was really, really cool. Um, the more realistic person I'd love to be mentored by is Tyson vocal at the foundation. Um, I just, he embodies something that I think is really interesting. He's open, he's kind, he's welcoming. Like you talk to some of these execs in, in different organizations or around the university and some, sometimes people are a little bit more reserved. Um, Tyson has always been so, um, so open and inviting and, um, I don't know. I just, 
I think he seems like a super cool dude and I kind of want to be his friend. Um, but I don't, I would never say that to him like that. <laughs> Except in front of thousands Whatever. of people yeah, sure. on this Whatever. podcast. That's fine. What is your fondest memory of TAMU in general? Um, in general, um, I was at the the game where AC Law hit that last second oh, shot yeah. to beat Texas, and I was I was supposed to be doing a group project that night, uh, and my buddy Michael Steele and I were like, we have to go to this game. We can't not go to this game. Like, yeah. let's go. And so I I made up some excuse, or I I actually think I told my group, hey, I'm going to the the game, and I'll go. I'll, I'll be a part of the group project later or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, went to the game. It was amazing. Um, I actually presented the whole project myself the next day because <laughs> I just didn't trust my group. We ended up getting like a really solid A on the project. So that was a great memory. I think in general, um, my favorite part about a and I came to AM and I wasn't really very sure of myself as a person. Um, I was probably way more reserved and, and kind of held back. Um, but over the course of my freshman year, I kind of came out of my shell quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and over the course of those four years, I, um, I don't know. I just realized that people are good and, and they want, you know, they're willing to be friendly and they're willing to be open and honest and, um, so I feel like over that time, I, I I learned more and more that people are good and I can interact with them and that I should do those things. So, Excellent. Yeah. We end each session with some good bull. This is an opportunity to recognize someone else for something good or great they have done. Do you have someone you would like to send some good bull? Okay. So I, I actually think there's a couple people I would like to, quote, send some good bull to. Um First, um, I have this friend, Jeff, uh, Hankins, him and his wife, Jenny, um, have been fostering this little girl for a while Oh, for three or four months now. And, um, it's, it's been really fun watching them. They've, they've had, they have one, one son. Um, and the funny thing is they, they kept like my wife and I have three, three kids and, and they would say things like, man, I don't know why, why like having multiple kids is so hard. And (laughs) and then they they get a second, a second baby in their house. And it's just, I think it kind of like ran them over this, this like second child idea of it kind of ran them over. Um, but in the last couple months, they've really like come alive and it's been really fun watching them do that. Um, kids are a big part of my life right now. And so that's kind of where all this stuff goes. But, um, the other, the other people I'll send it, send some good bull to is, um, St. Thomas early learning center. Um, Beth Lawrence is the head of school there. And then Mrs. Flynn is my son's kindergarten teacher. And Tracy Sawyer is my daughter's pre-K teacher. And I'll just say they, there is some kind of magic at that place that they, um, they love my kids so well that it's impossible for me not to just brag on them. Um, my kids have come alive. They're, they're better people than they were. They will probably be, I hope they're much better people than I am, uh, when they're adults. And a lot of that will be credit to the really, really good people at St. Thomas. How can the listeners keep up with what you are doing? How would you like them to follow you guys? Is there... Sure. We're on all of your um, social platforms at TX Filmworks. Um, We're about to launch a new website. We've got our brand launch later this week. I know that Mm -hmm. later this week will be... We just launched our brand a month ago or so, probably when the podcast comes out. Mm -hmm. Um, That's good. Keep up with us on TexAgs. um, all that stuff, you know, if, if there's organizations out there that are interested in telling a story, anything like that, like I'm always up for having a conversation, even if that's me saying, you don't need me to do this. Um, I'll, I'll try and shoot you straight. So Andrew Kilzer, <laughs> look him up. Thanks for joining us. It was a royal pleasure having you on oh, the show, sir. I appreciate that. It was, it was good being with you guys. This is fun. Giga. Thank you so much for watching. If you would like to stay up to date on our latest videos, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to receive notifications. If you're in a rush or on the road, you can still join us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. If you want to learn more about us or our guests, please visit our website at maze.tamu.edu slash podcasts. Also, please check out Maze Business School's academic programs. They're the sponsors of our show, and you can find them in the description. Thanks, and gig them.